every Thanksgiving, I sit around with my nieces and nephews. You know, I usually tear apart their 401ks or talk about their... <laughs> they were all in ESG funds. So I said, you know, you know, Marin, why are you in this fund? Oh, you know, climate change. Marlia, why do you own this fund? Well, you know, make the world a better place. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, it's doing no such thing. Funds that claim to invest based on ESG, environmental, social, and governance issues, are so popular they've attracted over $120 trillion in investments. But are they worth your hard-earned investment dollars? I'm Ed D'Agostino, and my guest this week argues that while ESG funds do have noble goals, they don't make the world a better place, and on top of that, they don't generate good returns. Terence Keeley, former executive at BlackRock and author of Sustainable, Moving Beyond ESG to Impact Investing, joins us this week at Global Macro Update from Malden Economics. So, Terry, it's great to see you. Really appreciate you coming back after our strategic investment conference where you said some some really insightful things. I, I always had this sense that ESG investing wasn't hitting the mark, but I, I, you quantified it for me. And I want to re- read some of your words back to you, if I may. You wrote in a, in a recent article, blind acceptance of ESG precepts has resulted in trillions, trillions of dollars of misallocated capital and zero progress towards its principal target, climate change. So with that as our frame, what's wrong with ESG? And what a great way to start. If anybody was bored by the topic, and I think you just uh, opened up their eyes and said, I made trillions of dollars and it's doing nothing. Um, you know, I, I, I think you've been kind enough to read my book. I, I wanted to write uh, enough on this topic to bring everybody from start to finish. These are very important issues. Uh, the world faces very, very challenging times. If anybody thinks climate change is not happening, they're not paying attention. Um, we do have um, a grave risk uh, as we go to 10 billion people on Earth of despoiling our air, our land, and our water in ways that will displace billions of people. It could really be, be. So I adopt the thesis in my book of we need to promote inclusive, sustainable growth. We, we're going to need to have economic growth, but it needs to benefit more people, and it needs to be sustainable for the, for the billions of people that have yet to come. We, we are actually stewards of the earth, as, as, as Pope Francis wrote in Laudato Si. And the fact of the matter is, Ed, that since the United Nations Principles of Responsible Investing were launched in 2005, more than 5,000 institutions have promised to follow those rules and they control $120 trillion. In other words, they bought hook, line, and sinker. It's the ESG thing. We've got to make it work. And here we are, 2023, right? And we all know we're no closer to solve it. We're, we're certainly not on path for Paris. There's a lot of reasons for that. I can get into it. But ESG is not going to be enough to result in the types of outcomes that it was launched with. The hopes are right. The methodology is wrong. I was hoping you would get into that because there's there's a lot of nuance in your argument. And I think that in this in this soundbite world, uh, this Twitterfied world that we live in, right? Somebody hears the somebody someone hears you say ESG isn't working, and so they automatically, I think, would assume that you disagree with a lot of the precepts of, of ESG. When in fact, after reading your your excellent book, Sustainable, um, it, it's pretty obvious to me that you actually are very much aligned with a lot of these concepts of environmental, social uh, governance. Um, you just feel like it's not working the way it's been implemented. So what, what happened? Was this a fee grab by Wall Street? Let, 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 let me take you on that journey because it actually was a journey for me. I've had the privilege Ed, of working, frankly, side by side with Larry Fink for the last 13 years, a good friend, wrote the forward to my book. Yeah. I believe that the journey that he was on for most of the last decade, decade and a half, was how do we get the best long-term outcomes for the globe? That's logical, right? Because 70% of the $10 trillion that BlackRock manages is for retirees. It's for people who need that money in 30 years. 
And so the, 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 I think the seriousness with which Larry and others in the field, but Larry was a real leader, how do we have the best outcome in 30, 40 years, led him to a lot of conclusions. You know, yep, climate change matters. Yeah, we probably should go all in on Paris. Uh, we need to strive for net zero goals. Um, and here's the sad fact of the matter. The way that that has been executed has been the exact same way that socially responsible investing has been executed. You remember the sin stocks, right? Alcohol, yes. gambling, tobacco, firearms. For completely valid religious or ethical reasons, many people have avoided the shares of alcohol, tobacco, gambling, firearms for decades. What has it done? It's done two things. One, it hasn't stopped people from smoking, drinking, gambling, or for that matter, Glocks. And we're going we're to have to invest in our arms yeah. industry soon. Not, not only avoid them, we're going to have to invest in them. They will be added into an ESG index soon. What, mark my words. Wow. Armaments will have to be added back in. Just like nuclear energy is now being added back yeah. in. Whoops, they got that wrong. But similarly, all the avoidance of those stocks led to underperformance. If you followed socially responsible investing rules, you avoided sin stocks, you didn't change sinning, and you had lower returns. I'm going out on a limb here. ESG is identical. And we learned it, right, in 2022, because everybody avoided these oil and gas shares, with the exception of Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett, who was right. not only long Chevron, but Occidental Petroleum was his overweight. This, that was the number one stock in the S&P 500, up 120%. Market was down 30, 35%, depending on what you're Occidental Petroleum was up 120%. That, isn't that, that sounds like something you want to own, doesn't it? <laughs> no ESG fund had in it. They, did, they had it in for good reasons that make no sense. That make no sense. So part of what I say at, in, in the book, and, 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 and happy to, 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 to have a, the discussion with anybody, red, blue, or white, is that we need to actually invest in our dirty firms and make them greener, not divest from dirty firms and just hope that they learn their lesson. If we are going to live in the world that I think we all want to live in, um, we're going to have to make the types of investments that promote greater social and more importantly, economic inclusion and, and, and environmental sustainability. That's so I think this is a really- The 1.6 is we actually have the capital. We only need to reallocate 1.6% of assets per year to find $4.5 trillion that can be genuinely invested for double bottom lines. I love that term, double bottom line. Can, can you explain that? Because I think it, yeah. is, it just gets to the core of what really needs to happen for a solution. I, I really appreciate the invitation. I spent the weekend signing a bunch of books, and I always close it with the same uh, you know, four words, do well, do good. It's actually possible in today's world to solve a problem and make a good amount of money doing it. Uh, you know, and I, I always roll out my favorite example, which is the you know, Sorensen Impact Foundation. And I'm, I, it, it's right on my mind because I just had a lovely weekend with the Sorensons. And um, I tell quickly the story. Jim Sorensen is a, a man who um, started a communications company. It hit hard times. He pivoted it to a very specific demographic, the hard of hearing. He mm. ended up hiring a bunch of deaf people and created a media company that suddenly had served a, a huge population that had been excluded. He sold this company for a billion dollars. How, uh, you know, do I need to come up with a better example of do well, do good? I can come up with a bunch of them. I can also come up with others where you're not necessarily knocking the cover off the ball, but you are matching the market, green bonds. It turns out green bonds and certain fixed income instruments have a requirement of actually doing something good for the world. It can be social, it can be environmental, it can, and there's, there's a validation process to that. I, I own green bonds. In fact, uh, all, 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 you know, one could say I have ESG funds because I own green bonds. Um, uh, another great example, the dirtiest building in town. I, I don't know where you're broadcasting from. Where are you? I'm in Connecticut. Oh, you're in Connecticut. Well, I, I don't know if you're in Stanford, but if there's some, you know, dirty UBS building there, uh, tear down, put up a lead certified building. They will have higher rents. You will have made money in the process and you will be doing less damage. Do well, do good. 
Is there other things? So, so Terry, when I, when I'm sitting here and trying to think, okay, if I'm a listener to this and I've been an investor in an ESG fund, um, I'm frustrated, right? Because if, if, if I'm, if I'm young, I want to invest according to my principles and to, to hear that it's not working has to be frustrating. If I'm older, well, I am older, right? So I'm 55. So <laughs> at 55, I'm over 54. I don't feel it either. And, and, you know, but if I'm looking at my portfolio, my ESG portfolio, if I've been in it for 20 years and it hasn't done anything, now I'm mad because this was supposed to be my retirement. What can they do? What, what, what can, because you're, you, you work next to Larry Fink. You've operated. Great man, with, wonderful man, hard in the right place. But your 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 career, your experience is atypical, right? I mean, you've operated at the highest echelons of finance. Um, most people, most most, I would say ninety percent, ninety five percent of people, like they don't, they have businesses or jobs or other interests, and they don't think about investing and in the markets all the time. So they trust. They're, they trust the fiduciary and you, you, you've gone out of your way to say you're a fiduciary. You want to, your, 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 your responsibility is to help people. Um, what, what can they do? How can they invest their conscience and get a rate of return and get that double bottom line that you talk about? Well, I, you know, every piece of investment advice you give, whether or not it's to a sovereign wealth fund or a 22 year old person or to Ed D'Agostino, is going to be very unique to your circumstances. But I have to tell you, this was a book I could not not write because every Thanksgiving, I sit around with my nieces and nephews and you know I usually tear apart their 401ks or talk about them. <laughs> they were all in ESG funds, all with Vanguard, by the way, and I'm working at BlackRock. Uh, but the, 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 I'm thinking, so I said, you know, you know Marin, why are you in this fund? Oh, you know, climate change, Marley Hill, why do you own this fund? Well, you know, make the world a better place. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, it's doing no such thing. And worse yeah. yet, Ed, the asset management industry is now being lazy. They are being lazy and dragging their heels, not coming clean. On what, in fact, these, but you have to read the very, very small print of every ESG fund. It says, we don't say that this is going to do anything sustainable. And you're out on your own there, kid. And yes, we're charging you 40 basis points wow. instead of three. Well, let me just say what I would say to that 21, 22, 23 year old kid who's socking away a couple hundred bucks a month or sticking the S&P 500 with Vanguard or BlackRock at one basis point. Why? What is it? One, one big misconception that I hope I cleared up in the book was that index investing is not passive. There is absolutely nothing passive about the S&P 500. In fact, 20% of the stocks in the S&P 500 change over every few years. Right. What, what, why has that happened? S&P 500 has dedicated themselves to try to find out which companies are on the up and up. What has just, you know, they're, they're, they're doing all that work for you. That was the genius of John Vogel and Vanguard. Uh, only one active manager out of every seven beats the S&P 500 over any five-year period. Only one out of 10 over every 10 years. And it ain't one of those seven. So, so, so you know, it's not a, a 20, 23, 25-year-old kid's ability to say, oh, I'm going to pick the active manager and I know where I can go and I'm going to find Warren Buffett. I mean, you know, one thing you'd say is own oh, Berkshire Hathaway. Unfortunately, Warren Buffett is mortal. Um, you know, he has practiced value investing is whole life. Value investing is about as far away from ESG investing as you can find. ESG investing has ended up being lots of tech stocks. I'll, I'll, I'll share something with you. One stock alone, one stock is responsible for the outperformance of Morningstar's ESG funds. Any guess? Apple? NVIDIA. Close. Um, I own Apple as a single stock, by the way. It's going to be hard to... NVIDIA. You take NVIDIA out of Morningstar's ESG funds and there's zero outperformance. Can I ask you a question, Ed? Should we have the weight wow. of the ESG thesis, trillions of dollars, rest on one stock? Please. Well, and then, you, and then you get into parsing, right? Like 
is NVIDIA a company that makes a lot of the, the um, equipment that goes into crypto mining? Is, is, is that green? You could you make know, the argument that it's not. And, and just since, since it's live and, and, you know, and we want to be real time, look at the brain fart that just came out of Anheuser, you know, NBEV, right? Yeah. They want to be inclusive. We do too. You do too. You know, I love literally every human being on earth. Yeah. When they decided through some advertising campaign to reach out to a demographic that sort of is still dividing America, the obvious happened. They lost a lot of their, as we all know, Bud Light fell from the number one beer in America, I think, to number yeah. four. You yeah. know, three Stunning. Now. Stunning. Uh, yeah. So what does that tell you? What that tells you is that the ESG mindset, as moral as it may be, as good as it may be, I'm casting no judgment, is not a way to generate alpha, is it? And I think, no. you know, I think you read my National Review article, which yes. was intended, you know, listen, I'm a center-right guy. Why? I have learned over the course of my, you know, you know what they say, right? If you're not a socialist in your 20s, you have no heart. And if you're not right. a conservative in your 30s, you have no brain. <laughs> um, uh, 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 markets, free markets. How do we allocate capital? How, how do we do how, When governments start to try to identify winners and losers, we end up with cylindras. Government agents are no more prescient. Uh, in fact, they're less prescient than that business guy that's on the front line that sees various things going on and is trying to get, like Jim Sorensen, capture the moment, capture the moment. And, and I'm sorry, Incentives are not particularly well aligned. You know, the, the misnamed Inflation Reduction Act, passing out money, you know, can't, can't give it out fast enough, right? Yeah. The way they're giving it out is going to ruin returns. It's going to ruin returns. It's going to completely disrupt the natural risk-reward allocation of capital. It is called the law of unintended consequences. And That's as you true. know, the road to hell is paved with many good intentions. Um, but let's, I, I like solutions. I, you know, I spend more than one third of my book at on solutions. One important thing I say about solutions, going back to that 22, 23, 24 year old, is don't just look to do good with your capital. Volunteer your time. Yeah, Start reading point. to uh, adolescent boys and girls who don't have a, a mother or a father. Um, put, your, put your heart into something that will change an individual's life and change their world. Uh, my wife does a lot of this work. She, 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 in fact, she's in a prison today helping a bunch of prisoners do, doing a workshop. And I always say, you know, I'm trying to change the world and she's trying to change your world. Well, everybody can go out and change two, three, four worlds a day. Yeah. Um, and, and we're going to have yeah. to do that. And here's the challenge, as I see it, of the 21st century and beyond. It's a major one. It, it, we're going to be 10 billion souls soon on this planet. And just, just, just wrap your brain around how important that is. We were 1 billion in 1800, 2 billion in 1900, 4 billion in 1985, and 8 billion in 2022. Greta Thunberg, I love you. I think you're a wonderful person. But one of the reasons why there's so much stress on the ecosystems around the world is there's 8 billion of us and 3 billion are still energy secure. 1 billion live in complete energy poverty. They're not living in Sweden. They are as important as any other thing, including clean. We want a clean world. I want a clean world. Of course we do. We should want to have as much abundant, cheap, reliable, clean energy as we possibly can. Here's the problem. If you look at any forecast for our consumption of oil and gas for the next 30 years, it's only going up. Absolutely. So if we, stop, if we stop producing oil and gas, Ed, who's laughing all the way to the bank? Vladimir Putin? Maduro from Venezuela? Yeah. They're, not, they're certainly not unhappy in Saudi Arabia. For also sure. friends of mine, I, 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 speak, uh, I don't speak disparaging of them. But if America is not energy independent, if America is not producing abundant, clean, cheap, affordable, reliable energy, people will suffer. By the way, they don't even have reliable energy in California. They're going to end up with a bunch of electric vehicles and no place to plug them in unless they get more nuclear. Right. 
Right. So I, you know, I, I, I would love to be part of the dialogue, ongoing dialogue in the country, which takes the temperature down of that does not do we, they, blue, red. It does mm -hmm. us. And, and, and an important part of my book is, you know, embraces Catholic social teaching. And I, I did this lecture recently at the University of Chicago with Luigi Zingales, which was my favorite lecture of all time, because I, I could be Milton Friedman and Pope Francis at the same time. And that's what I want to be. Uh, <laughs> but what, what, what I think the important thing to say is that human dignity, uh, we're going to need free markets. Uh, John Paul II, you know, read, read his wonderful Chantissimus Annus, uh, completely endorses. Socialism didn't work. Guessing which companies to invest in, it doesn't work. It doesn't work, Ed. We're going to have to, though, be more mindful. We're going to get the world we deserve. We're going to get the world that we fight for and work for. We're going to get the world that we plan for and execute. So how do you, how do you say when you've got $120 trillion yeah. being misallocated? Yes and fees being collected on that. Yes. How do you unwind that and, and fix it? I mean, one of the things that I like so much about Warren Buffett is he invests in companies that think long-term. And, 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 and if, you, if you think long-term as a CEO and as a management group, and you manage your company long-term, then it forces you to take into account how well are my employees doing? How well are my suppliers doing? You know, how, how well are all of my, I believe you call them stakeholders, not just shareholders, but stakeholders yeah. doing. Yeah. Is, is that part of your solution? Well, let, 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 me, let, me, let me, you know, quickly go back to, 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 to Warren Buffett because in fact, he's a value-based investor. And I like to, to dwell on Occidental Petroleum because what was, Vicki Holub is a visionary CEO and mm -hmm. what did she identify as a growth market? She identified as a growth market um, petrol for jets that is zero carbon. And that's why she's building the largest carbon capture plant in the world so that all those guys who like to fly to Davos and say they're doing it with a zero carbon footprint can actually say it's true because <laughs> Vicky Holub had the sense, now they, they have to pay a lot more for that energy. Vicky Holub actually is creating value by understanding where consumers are changing what was and so so just remember Warren Buffett is a value based investor he likes to see well trains are going to become more important i'm going to buy them now because i see where that's going this is undervalued that's 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 a, I, I i always want to be careful when i start giving advice about what to do with people's money because you know what Ed? it belongs to them you know th this yeah. you know it was this idea so i have done more than 120 trillion dollars worth of transactions over my career i have done them with the world's largest sovereign wealth funds central banks and every time i just focused assiduously on what are your goals and each one of those kind of client bases an insurance company has a very different need uh, than a 22 year old individual pensioner Sure. In fact, insurance companies have rules and regulations that they have to follow, capital charges. So, so you go through this you know, exercise of always trying to optimize relative to competing objectives. One thing I would love to see is better measurement of impact in all these funds that claim to be doing well and doing good. I, and I wrote this uh, in another scenario. Every single fund that carries sustainable on it, if it, if it has the honor and the privilege of carrying this, show us. What exactly are you promising us that it's going to do that a, let's say, different portfolio won't do? When it comes to the public equity markets, that, that will end up being very, very hard. There is very little value that can be created in the public equity markets, but through the process of stewardship but through the process of voting shares. So that's why a lot of people are really afraid of BlackRock and Vanguard right now. They got these big clubs, right? You know, 20% of the votes, they can shift to just this. And, and so there's a lot of fear over what those institutions will do. Well, I've studied those institutions. I actually think the stewardship team at BlackRock is excellent. I have, a, uh, and I, I'd invite anybody listening to join my solutions forum, which is on my website www.1.6.com. I have a solutions form. It's a curated town square where anybody has a good idea, you put it up. 
whether or not that's a, an investment mm-hmm. pitch or just, but what one, one uh, blog entry I have is entitled, why I let BlackRock vote my shares and you should too. Now, now for a guy who's like, you know, well, hold it, aren't you, aren't you the anti-ESG guy? Uh, uh, ESG is not going to accomplish what it claims to accomplish. E, S, and G should never have been put together to begin with. It's overly inclusive. Early on in the book, I call for a divorce. If you want E, let's do E. If you want S, let's do S. If you want, well, everybody should do G. Jesus, right. you know, sine qua non. It's like G. Well, you, you don't right. care. Get, get out of here. Uh, you, you know, nope. G, I mean, and this led to crazy things like FTX having a higher ESG score by one rating agent than ExxonMobil. Yeah. What? What? Right. I mean, what craziness has come out of this? What yeah. craziness has come out of this movement? So the data is not particularly reliable. But you ask me, you know, what should we do? What we should do is let people have more information um, and, and better uh, an ability to make better decisions about achieving their specific objectives. I always say, I'd, you know, as a practicing Catholic, that no marginal tax rate gets me to heaven. You know, uh, <laughs> I, I want to, you know, uh, uh, I've had the privilege, I suppose you've had the privilege too, of paying a higher tax rate. It is a privilege. I, I, I accept it. But if, if Bernie Sanders has had his way, um, uh, all those taxes, and I would just be pissed off and I wouldn't be going to heaven. You know, right. I kind of want to go to heaven. I can only go there by my own works. I know you didn't want a theological broadcast. Okay. But let's, let's, let's just be frank. We are human beings working in the vineyard, trying to do our best and, and getting home and caring for all those we love. And you know who I love? Everybody. Everybody, Ed. But you know yeah. who I love most? It's, this is, you probably remember Rose Kennedy said this. She was asked which of her, which of her nine children did she love most? The one most in need, the one who is down, most down of heart, the one who's crying, the, 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 the one who just fell down. That's the one. And I think I come from a tradition where, yeah, the last will be first and the first will be last. There's a whole lot of hurt in this world. I loved Pope Francis when he referred to, you know, the, the, the world as a field hospital. I'm right now in the Upper West Side of Manhattan. During COVID, the, ugh, this was immense. Yeah, addicts, homeless. Uh, I cried. And I cried. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? So uh, what I would say is it's harder than hell to be the S&P 500. you got to really make a pretty strong case to get me out of the S&P 500. I have a few stocks that I think are going to outperform. JP Morgan, Apple. I just did a lovely broadcast with Consuelo Mack uh, on Wealth Track, and she made me give my top four. Um, listen, if markets are going up, own BlackRock because it's a levered call on beta. If markets are going down, don't own BlackRock because it's a levered call on the way down as well. Hmm. Um, So I can give you, you know, active management, but if I'm giving advice to, you know, uh, I've done a lot of work with, 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 with sovereign wealth funds, or more importantly, let's, let's, let's give the example of, of, of university endowments, university endowments, university of Notre Dame, number one in the country, shout out, go Irish, Mm -hmm. fighting Irish guy. Um, They've completely followed Catholic investment principles and they kicked everybody's butt. Yeah. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're top 1%. They beat Yale. They beat Harvard. How did Catholic Notre Dame uh, in the highly competitive endowment space do so well? And now that they've done so well, can do more good because they have those profits to give kids scholarships to build new buildings. I, I, I've known the CIOs at, at Notre Dame and they're always the same. We're going to kill it so that we can do more good. Yeah. And they're going, we're going to kill it while still following Catholic principles. Yeah. Notre Dame did it. They did it. I'm so proud. Um, and I would say, you know, Harvard, eh, not so good. Um, as you, if you remember, you know, they were doing really well under Jack, Jack Malby, I think it was. And then yeah. the alumni got upset because they were making so much money. So then all those people left and, and they, they outsourced that money. And then during the 2008, during, during the crisis, Harvard was in the worst position of any uh, of any university endowment. They had to sell their PE portfolio just to make capital calls. It was a mess. It was a mess. They're still in an enviable position overall, though. Yeah, I'm not. I don't. I don't <laughs> you know, one, one thing I talked about, for example, in Chicago is a, a, a great example to always study. I, I, I'm very impressed with uh, Stanford University's 
investment uh, 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 agreement, you know, what, what, what is their state, statement of principles? I think every institution should have a very clear set of objectives that they're following that is their North Star that is laid out. And so this, of course, is the case with the largest sovereign wealth fund in the world, which is Norway's. Okay. Norway has a very simple but specific investment guideline. They want to maximize returns responsibly. Maximize returns responsibly. Now, we say, well, what does that mean? You know, what is this? Well, it means exactly what they say, which is they're trying to, they, they have an asset allocation. Uh, they definitely use their stakeholder, shareholder capabilities to vote aggressively. Um, and uh, they care a lot about clean water. Um, so they're making a lot of investments uh, in clean water systems, and they did recently dedicated 5% of their, their, their assets, which is over a trillion dollars, to infrastructure. And they're actually making some allocations to clean energy infrastructure in the developed world, which is critical. Let, let's be very clear. The United States, the entire North American continent and EU can get our emissions down to zero, net zero, and we're still on course for four degrees Celsius. Do you know why? Yeah, the rest of the world, just massive so pollutants. Three countries, China, India, and Russia. Sure. If you actually want to make the world a better place, activists, um, understand that climate change is a collective action problem. And if all you do is hog tie the United States, make it less competitive, and China doesn't care, they're right. coming to lunch. Right. They're already getting cheaper energy from Putin than any place else in the world. Yeah. And what are they doing that with that? They're making cheaper goods and trying to export their way to prosperity at the expense of those who don't have access to Putin's cheaper energy. That's how markets work. Right. And markets, uh, you, you make money by solving problems. So, well, and then that, that's the point, right? I mean, it, 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 uh, let's let's talk about Apple. What an amazing company! I mean, you, you know, just just think of how much Apple dominates our ecosystem. You know, I we, we sure. have a technology problem as we're starting up here, and I've got my Apple on, my Mac on, my my iPad on, and um, what it would take for me to leave the Apple ecosystem? I don't know. I can't imagine it. Yeah. Uh, I probably have to go to Mars uh, and you know speak to Elon Musk about what he what, what whatever he's what, whatever he's got up there. <laughs> but the, the truth of the matter is, um, Henry Ford also focused on, focused on this. So I, I tell that anecdote in my book. I, I, yeah. I appreciate. You, I really appreciate you reading it, and I, I love the way you it up. Um, can I just tell anybody out there who wants to get rich writing books? It won't happen. <laughs> uh, 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 it's uh, hard. Uh, uh, while I say I, that was a book I could not not write, it was a very expensive thing to do. But you know what I have? That is a clean conscience. Sure. Yeah. Terry, let's let's end this with uh, just a quick rundown. I think you wrote this. It was It's from an article in the National Review. Yeah. And I think you wrote it more for market participants, for professionals. But I, I think it also, I think it's valuable for everyone. So maybe we could just run down. You had a list of five things. Yeah, I know that... you the five, I'd love to do the five, but let me give you a little bit more context. Sure. Um, what has been happening with that article is that there's a, there's a conservative organization called American Compass, uh, Orrin Cass, and, and he and one of his colleagues, Julius Klein, had put out an article about conservatives have to get on the ESG bandwagon. If conservatives don't get on the ESG bandwagon, we're going to be left behind. And I was like, it, but you know, this is a non-financial guy. He doesn't get it. ESG, in my opinion, is fatally flawed. I have an article out in the Journal of Corporate uh, Finance, uh, Applied Corporate Finance, called Hardwiring Corporate Goodness, where I lay out in detail for you wonks what it's going to take for ESG to succeed. The punchline, don't hold your breath. So when I ended up writing this National Review article, I was trying to say, I I've learned over my life to be more conservative. You know, we need to have the strongest military in the world. Uh, we need to let free markets uh, do their work. We also mm -hmm. need to care for our brothers and sisters. What the National Review article, and let's go through the five now, Ed, was intended to do was to just say, you know, liberals, this is where you're wrong. But, you know, conservatives, this is where you need to keep your eyes open. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you for that, for that setting the stage. So the, the first one you say is pretty simple. Just let markets work. And if you don't, Friedrich Hayek is going to come back from the grave and, and haunt you to death. Uh, you know, as, as we all know, uh, and his, the fatal conceit is what is, is really where he encapsulates the, the, this work. 
For anyone to say right now, Ed, that they know what the temperature of the earth is going to be in 30 years, we don't know what technology is going to come. For anybody to say right now that there will be no war in two or three years, we just don't know. Yeah. There's so much we don't know. And so the free markets, are they perfect? No, they generate externalities, two of which are damage for the, for, for the environment and widening income. But we, we, we need to deal with those externalities separately. But there has been nothing in the course of human history that has been more powerful at eliminating poverty than free markets. In 1980, one out of every two people on the planet was living under less than $1.91 a day. Today, it's one out of 13. How did that happen? Where did all that poverty go? Free markets. Free markets, Ed. You know, one counterpoint to bring up, not to get too bogged down, but I found it really fascinating. Um, and, and it came up in a conversation I was having with my nephew uh, just last night. Uh, mm. He's 29. Mm. And you know, when you listen to somebody who's 28, 29 out in the working world, uh, but still, still young and, and, and liberal, um, y- you know, it's, it's a real reminder of, of the perspective that they have. So there was a quote in your book about how, I can't remember how many years ago it was 20, 25 years ago. You said that if, if you were born in the bottom 20% of income in the low, lowest quintile, that you had a 50% chance yeah. of making it to the top yeah. in this yeah. country. Yeah. And that's, that's that I read that and I thought the, the that's what makes free markets in this country amazing. But then you said today, your odds are only 8% to go from the bottom to the top. So from a younger person's perspective, right? Relatively speaking, you and I have already made it. We got lucky. We got lucky. We Absolutely. are old. We're and, 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 and had a lot of people that got us here and, and, and all those things that go with that, yeah. that opportunity for, for the majority of, of, of people that were in our situation, it's gone. Think of the tragedy, Ed, of having most of your future determined by your zip code. Think of the tragedy of having no other option but to go to PS whatever in Queens because yeah. you didn't get picked for the lottery for the yeah. you know for, for the charter school, which will certainly educate you much better. We have uh, economic mobility in the United States has ossified. And what have we done? You know, there's a great book uh, by my friend Senator Phil Graham called "The Myth of American Inequality." He's absolutely right about the data. We've done a lot, we've thrown a lot of money. Uh, at these issues. It turns out that the bottom quintile and top quintile, once you account for taxes and transfers, that's four, four, I think 4.2, the, the top quintile versus the bottom quintile. If you look at it the way the Bureau of Census reports it, it's actually 14 times, but they don't include taxes. They don't, what am I saying? <laughs> the important thing to take away is we have anesthetized poverty. We've given people food stamps, uh, there's a, you know, a little bit of low-income housing out there. But where's the opportunity? How does a kid born full of life and full of capabilities actually realize their God-given talents growing up in, pick, pick a city, Compton, California. Sure. You know, you sure. just, and so this is a challenge of our time. So this is why Jeff Bush said that charter schools are in fact this, the, the, the civil rights issue of our time. And a good friend of mine, John Hope Bryant, who also endorsed my book, has a great line. He talks about silver rights instead of silver. So, and what he does, God bless him, it's an NGO that helps people get their damn FICO scores up so that they can actually qualify for a housing loan. Because 50% of Americans today Ed, spend more than 50% of their income on rent. Yeah. You know where that's yeah. going? That's going down the toilet bowl. Sure, if they exactly. Actually find a way to own a property. One, they take better care of it. Two, they'd be building up wealth, wealth creation, and the 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 the, the, the joy of both the self esteem as well as the benefits of wealth creation is a civil rights issue of our day. This is the challenge in an era of abundance. This is what I talk about in the book. We live in an era of abundance. Yeah. We are, we don't understand how many problems we can solve now if we just do it right with yep. the right solutions. 
that brings us to number two on your list. Yeah, and I'm talking too much and I, I, no, I, no. we're losing our audience, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, understand that consumer, societal, and worker attitudes change. That's the next one. I, you know, I love to talk about Jane Fraser in that because Jane Fraser is a CEO yes. of the city. Very early on realized, holy cow, this COVID work from home thing is helping my workers be more loyal. If you are a, a young mother and you've been doing the two hour commute back and forth, and now you can work at home and be with your kids who are all under the age of three, are you kidding? You're going to work harder. You're going to work harder. This finally worked. So, so the idea of, and you know, Jamie Diamond and others, you know, just how do you create, in, if you can genuinely create employee loyalty, you're going to have a better run company. Costco is another example I talk about in the book. Costco pays their people a lot more, right? And they keep their, their prices real. What a model. Oh, Costco's another stock I would own, by the way. Uh, it's just absolutely clear that if you take care of your stakeholders the way they want to be taken care of, Walmart, right now you can do a GED. You can work for, a, you can actually take uh, courses at Walmart so that you can take an SAT and go to college. Mm -hmm. Why do they do that, Ed? They do that because the times demand it and it creates more loyal employees, which makes you a better company. Yeah. Yeah. Number three. Number three, double down on share owner primacy. Who owns Apple? Who owns, who owns your house, Ed? If somebody came into your house and said, change, I don't like the carpeting and could you change it? Wouldn't you throw them out? The people that own Apple are not the activists in the street. It's the people that have it in their pensions and 401ks. To try and think that there is any other voice to direct a company other than the owners of that company is, well, one, it's illegal. So, you know, this is follow the law. Uh, and this was the famous case that you probably uh, remember that I talk about in the book with Ford Motor Company. But two, it's just the wrong thing to do for the company. The, the, the company, yeah. and by the way, shareholders pay attention. You know, the, the number four, I remember now, remember that, that the shareholder priorities are changing too. Yeah. Why is it that during COVID, uh, shareholders of Wendy's required that they join, Wendy's join the, um, I think there's a, a workers association for, 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 um, you know, uh, meat processors and has, the Wendy's refused to join. The vote was 85% that they had to join. They didn't want to, but shareholders said, no, 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 no. This is a, this is a risk too much to bear. Similarly, DuPont was forced by its shareholders, its shareholders to write a study about where the 10 trillion plastic pellets that they create every year are ending up. Why would they do that, Ed? Well, guess what? Five years from now, who knows what kind of lawsuit is going to come down, just like it did ultimately for Purdue Pharma. You know, they, 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 were, they, were, they knew what they were doing. DuPont knows what it's doing. There's way too much plastic that's ending up in the oceans. And mm -hmm. if DuPont is just saying, oh, no, we're just the producer, we're not responsible for what's going down. That's going to bite them in the butt. So part of what I would say to, you know, my Republican friends is, you know, when these shareholder resolutions get passed that require more of the company than perhaps you think it should, well, you're not the owner of the company either, are you? And that's where people worry about BlackRock and Vanguard voting ways. So, so Vanguard and BlackRock introduced choice. You can now, if you have a BlackRock or Vanguard fund, you can vote your own shares. Newsflash, you won't do it. Right. You, you, you're, you're not right. going to be casting 106,000 votes a year. You're probably busier than that. But yeah. that was number four. And number five, if I recall, was adopt uh, effective remedial solutions. What, right. what, what works? What works? What works? You know, people used to say a carbon tax. Carbon tax will, will solve. Carbon tax, will, carbon tax might solve, might help if everybody has the same carbon tax. Can I see China's carbon tax? Can I see? Otherwise, you're just going to distort. What would be more effective than carbon taxes? It would be a pretty effective thing. My good friend, Paul Ryan, has a very good idea, which is a border adjustment carbon tax. Okay, let's say that we're only going to have certain types of goods enter our country that have a specific carbon content. And if it has more carbon content, we will have a higher tariff, higher tax. Interesting. Uh, 
So, so you know, I, I'm just throwing out a couple ideas. There are solutions that work. They're also on my solutions forum, on my website. And I, you know what? I'm all ears for better ideas. I talk a lot about exemplars of hope in the book, which are my favorite NGOs in the world. There's, there's just so much work that's being done by the Environmental Defense Fund, Operation Hope, which I mentioned earlier, uh, the Laboratory for Economic Opportunity at Notre Dame, but really looks at what programs are, are, are you know, lowering recidivism, what's keeping kids in schools, uh, what, what is helping uh, you know, young mothers finish, you know, basically community college in America is free. Ed. It turns out that 85% of the community college courses that are taken never are carried to completion. It turns out the reason why is that the people that can't complete their college community are busy taking care of their kids, their breastfeeding. Yeah. And they found out that Catholic charities uh, in Dallas, Fort Worth, found out that if you sign a caseworker to everybody who's in a community college, their completion rates increase by sixfold. That's, uh, that's an amazing statistic. Amazing. So, so solutions that work, solutions that work. I, I, I promise you they're going to be non-ideological and they're going to involve looking into people's hearts and souls and meeting them where they are. Please do me a favor. In the comments below, let me know the types of topics that you'd like me to dig into and if there's any specific guests that you'd like me to bring on to Global Macro Update. There's a link to Terry's website, 1.6.com, in the description below, along with a link to his excellent book, Sustainable, Moving Beyond ESG to Impact Investing. I really appreciate you watching.